Last week, we heard a little bit in the sermon about the Magnificat, the song of praise that Mary sings about her conception through the Holy Spirit or her, her becoming pregnant through the Holy Spirit and, um, and all the great things that God has done and will continue to do for the people. Today, I want to turn the focus onto her husband, Joseph, the righteous man, and praise him a little bit. The Gospel of Matthew focuses in its birth story on Joseph. Uh, Luke, the only other Gospel writer who writes a birth story for Jesus, focuses on Mary and wrote the Magnificat. Joseph is called a righteous man in this Gospel, and that is partly because the writer, Matthew, has several special aspects to this Gospel. It was written um, at the end of the first century, and it was, it's known in its tone for being anti-Roman Empire against the powers that were attempting to suppress the Kingdom of Israel, and also to, also to be anti-Jewish religious authorities. It has an unusual uh, twang to it of, of um, moral stringency. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, you know that there's a lot of finger shaking at us to be good, not to be bad. Lots of moral stringency in Matthew. And probably the thing you know it best for, if you've studied the Bible at all, it is famous for demonstrating that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies in Isaiah and other books of a Savior to come. That's why we keep hearing readings from Isaiah and then Matthew, so that we will see, oh, that is what Isaiah was talking about. That is the way Christians, at least, interpret those verses. And so part of that proof is in the verses right before the verses you heard today. The proof that Jesus is um, the next king to come is in his lineage. And that lineage is fascinating. What Matthew presents is the 40 generations of men that have led to Jesus. 40 men are named in that lineage, coming from, from, starting with Abraham, going through King David, and he's known as a Davidic king, the whole kingdom that comes after David or kingdoms that come after David. Here's the interesting thing. Only four women, in addition to Mary, only four women are named. And they are four controversial women if you're talking about the sexual mores of women. Women who have been in, behaved in ways that would be considered socially unacceptable at the time of the writings about them. Tamar, the Tamar who slept with her father-in-law, tricked him into sleeping with her so she could have children. Um, Rahab, Battle of Jericho Rahab. Ruth, and, um, and I'm forgetting my last one, Bathsheba, Bathsheba. So Tamar, wow, I'm really losing it here. Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. All of them controversial for that reason, and also all of them thought to be Gentiles. So remember that often men were adjured to marry only um, Israelite women, but in, in times of necessity, marry Gentile women. All of those women were known to be outsiders, Gentile women. And they're the only women that are named. The 36 other good little women were not named. Only these four women are named. What is Matthew getting at? What is God getting at? Well, let's see. Then we get to Joseph and Mary, and Joseph is in a quandary. He's a righteous man, and I read that both ways, that he follows the Torah. You are known to be righteous if you followed the religious rules of the time. You're also known to be righteous if you behaved in a holy manner, that you were, you were ethical, not just following the rules, but thinking what would be kind and good. And so he decides as a righteous man both to do what the law says a man should do if he finds out that his betrothed is pregnant and not by him. But he also wants to be respectful to Mary, so he's going to dismiss her quietly to avoid her public shaming, and I would add his public shaming, because it was humiliating to the man and damaged his family reputation as well in that time. And then an angel comes to him and says, do not be afraid, notice, do not be afraid to marry her, for she has been become pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And Joseph takes a huge risk 
a huge risk in his time because the rest of the world doesn't know this. The rest of the world is going to say that he married a woman who was pregnant before he married her. That's what it's going to look like to them. So he does something that's courageous in his time for a, a, a righteous man, a good man. He takes care of her. He respects her body. He says, I'm just going to let you have this moment you have with this divinely inspired pregnancy that I don't understand. And he respects her religious and spiritual life. He respects that something is happening to her. And he listens to God. A God who is telling him something contrary to the religious rules of his time. It's an incredible story. One that means something even in our time. And here's the interesting thing, because the prophecy says that the child is going to be named Emmanuel, God with us. That's the literal translation, God with us. And that is indeed how we understand Jesus. But the angel says, and you will name him Jesus, which means he saves. Well, the first customer of the saving Jesus is Joseph himself. Because if Joseph had acted as expected, according to the religious rules of his religion at the time, he should have dismissed her quietly, that's nice, but still he should have dismissed her. But he doesn't pay attention to that. He doesn't. He's saved from the sin of abandoning the baby Jesus. Saved. Doesn't even know he's about to trip into that. Saved. You have to know that you need to be saved in order to want a savior. It doesn't really matter if he's come to be save us if we don't know that we need to be saved. One of the interesting things about this passage is that it highlights how when societies are in turmoil, they use religious rules to control people and usually to control women. This is what has been so controversial in Iran and is causing the uproar at the World Cup because some people want to show support for Iranian women and the Iranian secret police are coming to the Iranian soccer players, football players and saying, you'd better not do any kind of protest. And it all had to do with a woman, a young woman, a very young woman's hair not being covered properly. And so the morality police who patrol the streets looking for women, it is women, I can tell you because I've been in Saudi Arabia, it's the women they're looking at, to see whether their heads are covered properly. And she was arrested and, and died in custody of the morality police. Notice how it is a religious rule, something about moral stringency, holding order in society by making sure that women aren't misleading men in any way. You've seen it happen in our country where there are uh, religious factions warring with one another about the control of women's bodies and whether women can obtain certain types of medical care, even to the point of people being violent with one another at sites where women can receive medical care. There's a difference between religion and rigidity, and it's very hard to tell at times. It's very hard if you want to live a moral life. Religion is a good thing. It's word. The word literally means that which ties us to God. And there are many things which tie us to God. Scriptures, faith, rules, morality. I'm partly Christian because you wouldn't want to know me if I weren't. Our worst inclinations would go fly wild if we weren't paying attention to morality and rules. They matter. And to other rules, like have four candles burning on the fourth Sunday in, Lent, uh, in Advent. Important. It would have been nice. It matters. It affects our spirituality. But when it becomes, can we get the candle lit? We can't start until the candle's lit then we know that we need to be flexible and let go of certain religious rules. Granted, it is difficult to tell, but what most of us use, most Christians use at our guideline, is, is, is the religious rule, the moral stringency, stringency that I'm following, is it enhancing love? Is it enhancing my relationships with other people? Is it fostering peace? Is it fostering the full dignity of every human being? Those are the questions we ask ourselves because it's not always easy to tell what the right thing is to do. 
That's the challenge. Religion helps us, but only so far. Only so far. It gets difficult at times. So religion is a good thing. Rigidity, not a good thing. And even before Jesus is born, Joseph is told to be flexible. And he listens. And he lets his wife be who she is supposed to be as a spiritual woman, as a physical woman who's going to be giving birth to our Savior. It's funny how rigidity gets mixed up with religion. I'll give you another example. When I was in college, um, I, I was Catholic. I was very religious. I went to church every Sunday and did all the things Catholics do. Um, and except, well, and in addition, not a lot of Catholics uh, at the time were reading the Bible all the time. I think Catholics often do engage in Bible study now, but uh, I wasn't introduced to it at all. And so when I got to college, I bought myself a Bible, weird, I know, and sat in my dorm room reading it secretly to myself because I was embarrassed to let anybody know that I was reading a Bible. I mean, what a ridiculous thing to do. So then my sophomore year, there were a bunch of kind of very fervent evangelical freshmen. And um, the, I was friends with well, everyone in the dorm, but I was friends with a young woman who lived across the way from me. And there was a young man, I remember him well, Baptist named Jim from Illinois. And um, he was leading the women in a Bible study in the room across the hall. And I thought, should I, should I out myself? as somebody who reads the Bible. That's what it felt like to me. I'm going to out myself as somebody who reads the Bible. But I did it. I went over, and you know how you just kind of, everybody in our dorm, we just if you saw an open door, you just sit down on the bed and you start chatting. So I sat down on the bed and go, what you doing? I knew what they were doing. It was obvious. And one of the women said, uh, Bible study. And I said, I read the Bible. Can I join you? And Jim said, no. And I was shocked. If, if they were playing Monopoly and I said, could I join you, he would have absolutely said yes. So I said, okay. And I was humiliated and embarrassed, and I went back to my room, and I just didn't know what to do. And one of the women even hung her head like that, like, whoa. And I, of course I thought that wasn't a very Christian thing to do, but I don't understand. Maybe he doesn't like me. So next week I figured it out because we had a uh, dorm party, and it was a, uh, a come as your favorite historical character party. So I came as the Virgin Mary. <laughs> it was accurate. And I brought a little icon of Mary and Jesus, and I held it up and I said, this is Jesus' baby pictures. <laughs> Everybody thought this was hilarious, and we were all very happy at this party until uh, Jim walked in and he physically charged at me. I mean, he was a very tall, skinny guy charged at me, and he said, that is idolatrous, you Catholics worship Mary, and that is idolatry. And I, I know there are a lot of former Catholics in here, and I said, we, we, uh, Catholics don't worship Mary, we revere her as a holy woman and the bearer of Christ, but we don't consider her God. I said, we worship Jesus just like you do. And he said, and she wasn't a virgin. I'm like, oh, here we go on that one again. Here we go on that one again. And I said, I don't know, um, you know, what, what your understanding of the Bible is, but my best understanding of it is that God asks us to trust the words of the Bible, that the, the, is the, the passages in Isaiah will say a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. It might mean a young woman. It might mean a woman who has never known a man. And certainly in the case of Jesus, there are many miracles in the, lives of Jesus, in the life of Jesus, many. Why not this one? But I said, if somebody was come to say to the whole world, you know, announcement from heaven, we didn't mean, you know, never had relations with a man, we just met young woman, I think I would say, okay, thank you for the clarification. <laughs> it would not throw off what I believed about Jesus. But he was insistent. And that's when I realized it had created this, this, his understanding of faith had created a rigidity that was going to separate him from me. He was not going to let me study the same Bible. He was not going to let me pray with him. We weren't going to go to each other's churches on alternate Sundays. Uh, uh, uh. 
because he had decided that I was an inadequate Christian despite worshiping every Sunday and reading the Bible in secret in my dorm room. Can you believe that? That's what I mean about rigidity as opposed to religiosity. We were both very religious. We both had religious practices, but it was rigidity. And I knew that it was wrong because it created division, not only for him, but for me. Because I thought, that's the last time I'm going to spend time with any fundamentalists. I didn't think they were bad Christians. I just thought they were bad for me to be around. So let's not be around them. And that lasted for a while. It took a while for me to get over that one little injury when I was 19. That's the difference between religion and rigidity. I said that you can't really recognize him as a savior until you know you need one. We need Jesus. We need saving. We need saving not only from the sins we do or would do, because he's preventing us right now from doing things we would otherwise do. We also need saving from the sins that are done to us or have been done to us. We need salvation of both kinds. So thank God he's coming. <laughs>